Good evening, everyone, and welcome. We are so excited to have you with us this evening, and we hope that this evening you walk away with some new information, something that you haven't heard before, and maybe learn uh, something more about what it means to have a leaky gut. But also, we hope that you'll learn a little bit more about Turnpaw Health and Wellness and what our hope is um, as we serve our community. And that is why we're here. We're here because we want to make a difference in the lives of people in our community and our greater community. So without further ado, we're going to get started with our program. And one of the things that we wanted to do tonight prior to Dr. Shannon coming and doing his presentation on leaky gut is we wanted to have an opportunity for you to meet one of our patients who, um, who has a great story to share with you. Um, she is going to be telling about her journey over the last year and her experience as a patient here at Turnpaw. So I'm going to be kind of doing a question and answer interview type thing. Um, so right now I'm going to invite Allie Howard to come on up. You, you should clap for her because <laughs> she is super brave to be able to come and share her story with you tonight. It is a little overwhelming when you stand up in front of people and you are sharing um, your story and a little bit about what's going on in your life. So thank you so much for being willing to share. So I appreciate that. My pleasure. Uh, so this is Allie. And Allie, can you tell us a little bit about how long you've been a patient at Turnpaw? One year. Exactly one year. A year and five days. <laughs> <laughs> Well, she really knows. She was counting. She paid attention. What made you choose Turnpaw? I was um, at my rock bottom, basically. Uh, sorry, I have this written down because I forget. <laughs> so I dealt with health issues the last 10 years of my life. And it basically came to a point where I couldn't walk, couldn't care for myself, and I knew modern medicine, antibiotics, those types of things were not feasible long term. So thankfully, my mom got me in to turn Paul with Dr. Shannon so quickly, and it radically changed my life. It's more feasible to live a healthy lifestyle than to just treat the symptoms forever. So can you tell us a little bit about what was going on prior to your first appointment that made you say, I, I can't do this anymore, other than you said you were having trouble walking, you were having trouble functioning. Mm -hmm. um, can you paint us a little bit of a picture of like what was going on that made you have those symptoms? Absolutely. So 10 years ago, I got bit by a tick. Um, was misdiagnosed with arthritis, treated for two years for that. Symptoms were getting worse. Um, when I was finally diagnosed with Lyme disease by a Lyme's literate doctor in Bloomsburg, um, who treated with antibiotics, and that worked when you were on the antibiotics, but as soon as you went off, the symptoms came back. Um, I battled with that for a while until I knew that wasn't going to be a long term. I didn't want to have to deal with this the rest of my life. And so when I came to Term Paul, it was a completely different picture where they weren't just treating the symptoms. They wanted to find the root cause and I don't have those symptoms anymore. I'm you know, living a better lifestyle now. And I'm able to do so much more, basically, like before I got sick, which I never thought I'd ever feel again. Wow, that's awesome. Can you explain a little bit about the process? Because once you speak with the new patient coordinator, they schedule you for your first visit. Can you talk a little bit? Because some of these people might not have ever experienced that and might not know what to expect. So your first visit, tell us a little bit about what happens at your first visit. So even before my first visit, I was desperate. And with my mom's help, she was already a patient of Dr. Shannon's. I, always, I was already on like a gluten-free, dairy-free, sugar-free, basically anything 
free. Free? <laughs> free of Except everything that. good, right? <laughs> eggs. I lived on eggs and um, meat. Meat and eggs. And so I did that prior to my first appointment just because I didn't want my symptoms to get any worse. And, but at the first uh, visit with Dr. Shannon, he asked me so many questions from 10 years ago when I first got sick, because it all this matters. It's all coming back to me. <laughs> and um, then based on that, he ordered blood work, which I got done right at the Mechanicsburg office. And that was the first step. Um, I knew, be, like, because they did my blood work there, I recognize how time sensitive some blood work is. And because of the, the lab nurses, I think Tammy might have been there, she, they saw how my blood reacted. It basically, it turned me on green. <laughs> so I was bleeding green, and yes, this is a plug-in for John Deere, because they're the best. <laughs> but um, basically, I was bleeding green, which is not normal. And that led Dr. Shannon to say, oh, she's got copper in her blood. OK, we got to know how much and why. So that was the first step. And modern medicine wouldn't have caught that. Like they probably would have just brushed it under the rug, and didn't notice it. So that was the first step in my healing journey, which made all the difference in catching it early, treating it aggressively, um, doing IVs, foot detoxes, getting the copper out of my body which ultimately was caused by my birth control that I was taking. So that was, yeah, definitely a, uh, a journey that I am no longer on. <laughs> I am much healthier and happier me. So you have a, first your one hour appointment, then you have your lab work, and then you have your second appointment. Tell us a little bit about your second appointment, other than it feels like a fire hydrant of information coming at you. <laughs> it's yeah. They give you a journal for a reason. You literally <laughs> should take a video, like a recorder, to just video or, you know, record the whole conversation. And you try to write down everything. But basically, they go over your food sensitivities. Um, thankfully, I didn't have a whole lot, but I was still, you know, gluten free, dairy free, sugar free. And, um, yeah, they go over your blood results and figure out your treatment plan um, from there. Awesome. So then after that, then you also have nutrition appointments. So what was that? How did that um, help you in your journey, the nutrition appointments? So because you were already, you said you were already gluten-free, dairy-free, sugar-free. So sometimes people are already doing those things, so they're like, why do I need to go to the nutritionist? So tell us a little bit about that. She was very helpful. Um, I saw Carrie particularly, and she was very helpful in like figuring out new recipes. Because, I mean, I was trying to cook for me and my husband, and he gets sick of eggs. <laughs> so I can eat eggs every day, but he can't. And I had to uh, modify our, you know, our lifestyle. It's it's a lifestyle change. It's it never felt like a diet and it doesn't feel like a diet because it's sustainable. It's, you know, you're eating, it's meats and vegetables and fruits occasionally if they're not super high in sugar, which I battle with sugar, um, mostly related to a yeast infection due to years of antibiotics. So that's mm. very real. So what have been the largest changes in your life since coming to Turnpaw and having this major change in your health? I can walk. <laughs> Praise I, the Lord. <laughs> I look forward to going on vacations. Um, I don't have to be thinking, okay, in an hour I need to find a bench like to mm. sit down for 
15 minutes. Um, I can go in long car rides and not get stiff. Like, and I used to be afraid to not sleep in my bed because my bed was the only thing that made me mm. not hurt. But now I can sleep in, you know, hotel beds and live a normal life mm. like a 30 year old. <laughs> That's awesome. So what would you tell what would you tell someone here tonight who has who hasn't experienced Turnpa and hasn't walked into this health journey themselves? What would you tell them um, who someone who might be on the fence about whether this is something they should try or not? As anyone who knows me knows, I I recommend Term Paul Health and Wellness, specifically Dr. Shannon, to everyone and anyone I talk to, um, because he's awesome, and he radically changed my life, um, because they all genuinely care, specifically everyone at the Richfield location, like, they genuinely care, um, they recognize that the Lord plays a vital part in complete healing, which I agree with 100%. And they're here to like help equip their patients with the knowledge to live healthy lifestyles. They're not just like modern medicine in and out in 15 minutes and you know, just want to treat the symptoms want to pop a pill. They genuinely care about the long game. But um, last but certainly not least, I credit the Lord working through Dr. Shannon to with the healing that happened in my body. I no longer have Lyme disease. I'm, you know, recovered. And the Lord heals, but he brings people into your lives that he uses, and I genuinely believe Term Paul's here for that reason. Thank you so much, Ali, for My sharing. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it is, it's hard to not be biased from your provider, but one of the which is different than many other medical practices is that when you see a provider at Turnpa, you're really seeing the whole team. One of the coolest parts about working there is watching how they interact with each other, and they're always asking each other questions. I, I mean, constantly, the providers are at each other's door. Hey, this is the situation. What do you think about that? So you're not just seeing one provider. You're seeing a team of people coming from different perspectives, um, looking at all the things that are going on. And so you're not just seeing, you're seeing one provider maybe face to face, but you really are seeing the whole team of providers. And I just think that's a fantastic thing. And another thing that makes um, Turnpaw different than a lot of other places is that it is a team approach and they are all working together to help people get better. Um, so tonight is my privilege and a couple years ago I got to share my story um, of how Dr. Shannon, again, Ali said, you know, Dr. Shannon, he's my favorite. Well, you know, I can't say that because I work there and I can't have a favorite because Dr. Brow gets a little upset if I ever say Dr. Shannon is my favorite. They are all my favorites in different ways. Dr. Shannon just happens to be my provider. And, um, but again, it's a whole team, so they've all probably heard about me at some point in their lives um, before I worked for them as a patient. And I have a very similar story to Allie's, and I am so grateful for what Turnpaw has done for not just my health, but my daughter's health, my husband's health. And more importantly, not more importantly, but in addition to that, um, the difference they've made in our community. Um, I love our community. I love, um, I love the fact that we're here. We have patients walk into Richfield all the time and like, why Richfield? <laughs> we have, we have literally like reps from different companies come and say, why did they pick Richfield? And I was like, you know, 
the Lord works in mysterious ways. <laughs> um, but I'm so glad they are here because I feel like we are making a difference in the lives of our patients. So um, it is my honor and privilege to introduce one of my favorites, um, my provider, Dr. Shannon, who's going to share with us this evening. Thank you very much. Wow, is that a tough act to follow? Allie, congratulations and great job. But um, you know what? My father is a chiropractor for, oh goodness, a long time. Um, he's 80 years old, and he always <clears throat> kind of instilled in us one main tenant, um, and it's the power that made the body heals the body. You just have to learn how to help manage it and get out of its own way. So um, when we talk to patients about that, it's health of host, not strength of bug. And it's true, when people start, when you start treating the symptoms, you're really not getting to the cause of the problem. And all of us, I think, collectively have some level of that, um, of that in us. And we talk about that a lot, that you know, God put a very strong immune system inside you. You just have to learn how to heal it, nurture it, support it, and not mess it up. So, um, but when your story, um, the one thing I'm just gonna kind of clarify, she didn't have a copper problem, she had an immune problem. And when people have Lyme disease for that long period of time, and you're just trying to kill the bug, there's a lot of other things that happen in your body when you take those kind of antibiotics. And we're gonna talk about leaky gut and how that kind of has an impact on that because those tissues are supposed to be healthy and nurtured and have good and bad bacteria, but the good has to be more dominant than the bad. And antibiotics reverse that. And so it makes the bad ones more dominant than the good ones. So we'll talk about how leaky gut has an impact with that. But when people are on antibiotics, years, right? Four years, five years? I can't remember how many years you were on antibiotics, right? Five years. Um, and it was a rotational thing, but every time she would come off it, she would flare up. The question is, is why? If antibiotics kill bugs, why would you know, an infection like Lyme disease keep coming back? And the answer is her immune system never became dominant and healthy enough to control the infection. Unfortunately, with Lyme disease, it doesn't fully go away. It's a spirochete, but we have to get our body strong enough to get it under control. Who here has had mononucleosis in their life? Don't be shy. Do you have mono now? Are you tired? Are you, are you sick? Well, do you have symptoms of mono now? <laughs> Good job, Jana. Um, no, the answer is no. Um, if you had, who had chicken pox when they were little? Do you have chicken pox now? You see where I'm going with this, right? You don't have chicken pox forever, your body resolves it, but do you, could you get shingles later? Yes, you could. Who gets shingles? Everybody that's had chicken pox? No, why do you get shingles? Why do you get shingles? Because your immune system isn't strong enough to keep it under control. That's our approach. That's what we look for. We need to help look at you in a different light. We take a different picture of your specific health and then say, okay, what do we need to do to tweak you? Okay, and help your body manage that and keep your immune system dominant, all right? So when we say, do you have leaky gut? You probably all do. Do we, if we, if, even if you do or don't have symptoms of your digestive tract, you could have a gut reaction going on because of foods and then it's triggering the immune system's response. All right, next slide. Can you jump to the next slide or the first slide? Uh, yeah, go to that one. All right, so. Tonight we're going to talk about leaky gut and how it can have manifestations in other parts of your body. Um, I know that sometimes when people come in, and, and Ali had kind of given that example, when you come in for your first hour visit, there's a bazillion questions. And the reason we have a bazillion questions is we need to figure out kind of the rabbit holes we need to go down. Um, you know, is there three rabbit holes, is there one, or is there 15? We're not going to just chase different symptoms and say, okay, well, this is, the, you know, this is the problem, but we need to test to see where we're going to go with that. When your symptoms are presenting and it's from a certain cause, we don't know specifically if it's from a bad digestive tract, a bad diet, or how you're not digesting or not absorbing your food properly, or if you're reacting to the foods that you're eating. We need to figure that out. And I'll explain to you why we look at it that way, because it becomes an immune stimulating problem, not just a digestive problem and not just a gluten problem. Okay, so joint pain, fibromyalgia, muscle aches, headaches, brain fog, fatigue, and leaky gut. And there's a lot of other symptoms that can be presenting from a, digest a poor digestive system, but that's way more than enough to talk about tonight. Next slide, please. So, a uh, simple slide. Do you want to treat your symptoms or look at the cause of your problem? The cause of the problem is where we want to focus on. We don't want to just treat your symptoms. Even if we use supplementation, do we want to do a pill for an ill? No, we do not. 
However, some people need certain supplements for the rest of their life. Who takes vitamin D? Who should take vitamin D? <laughs> right? B vitamins, vitamin D, fish oils. Who eats fish on a regular basis? Who doesn't eat fish on a regular basis? They're really needed for just normal function. And if you're not taking essential fatty acids, vitamin D, vitamin C, not that we all don't get a lot of it. If you don't eat fruits, you don't. But those concepts, I mean, you need to take those supplements. If you go into the sunlight, are you getting enough uh, vitamin D that's converting the cholesterol in your skin to vitamin D? Are you getting enough if you're out in the sun? Not typically. Why? Well, most people aren't out a lot. In Pennsylvania, we're far enough away from the equator, we're not going to get a lot. And furthermore, are you covered up when you're going out there? 30% of your body exposed for 30 minutes a day is enough D for the day without sunscreen and without, without being covered up too much. Not too many of us are going outside without sunscreen, so there's an, you know, we're, there's an issue with vitamin D production, but you can't burn either. So we need to supplement with vitamin D. It's extremely important. Dr. Turnpaw says it's the most cost-effective supplement on a daily basis. It's what, two bucks a day, I think, something like that. It's cheap for you to have the biggest impact on your health, vitamin D. All right, so next slide. Sorry, I get off on little tangents, I apologize. Um, so natural remedies for pain. If you go on the internet and Google it, there's a ton of different symptomatic or symptom symptomatic relieving uh, substances and herbals and remedies and gels and creams. But again, we don't wanna just control or, or control the pain, we want the reason why. Next slide, please. So who here has brain fog, or if maybe you've never heard of that, who's here, brain just doesn't work quite right, what's your name, you know, it doesn't go as fast as it used to be, you know, I think I'm getting older, maybe it's just my age, it's not, it's, it, brain function doesn't have to decline rapidly with age, it has a lot to do, there's a strong correlation to your gut and your brain, there's a strong correlation to inflammation and brain function, and what you eat and how your brain kind of works as well, so we'll get into a little bit of that tonight. Go ahead and please, next slide. All right, so busy slide, so I'm just gonna read through it real quick. Uh, we have patients presenting with many different symptoms. We don't just see digestive patients, we don't just see Lyme patients, we don't just see copper toxicity patients. We see, Dr. Tarnpa has coined the term, we, don't, we see I don't feel good-itis. If you don't feel good, we can help you. How? Come see us, we'll figure it out. Um, where do we start? Um, we really start with what you eat, how you eat, how your body digests, how you move, how you sleep, those are kind of foundational things that we look at. Obviously tonight we're gonna to talk about the eat and digest part. Of all the different areas of concern, the digestive system is by far the biggest trigger to ongoing symptoms and poor health. When you put a food, let's say gluten, into your stomach and your body reacts to it, 85% of your immune system is initiated with gut function like that. If you have leaky gut, it becomes a little bit more uh, dominant or more problematic. Who here eats the regular Grains, regular gluten. Who here eats breads, pastas, cookies, cakes? All right. <clears throat> We're going to talk a little bit tonight about why that might be a problem for you and you might want to reconsider. Um, I'm very anti-gluten, so I'll just put that out there as a disclaimer. So I think all of us should be off it. and I'll, You'll see why um, as we go through this. Um, what is leaky gut? It's the common term used that describes poorly functioning digestive system when the normal tight junctions, cells kind of are, are inside the body and the cellular level, the very first layer are supposed to be real tight junctions and they can open up and that's hence the term leaky gut. And bigger food particles and bacteria and viruses can kind of go through different areas of the body where your immune system gets upset. Hope that was an easy way to explain what leaky gut is. <laughs> is that, wasn't that not too easy? Okay, permeate it and then we need to heal it. Luckily we can do that or God, God given innate ability can do that. Next slide. All right, so the gut microbiota, that is your good bacteria or the balance between the good and bad bacteria in your digestive tract. It can lead to host immune reactions. So there's a strong di uh, communication between the gut and the immune system and it can lead to a bunch of different symptoms and these are one of the more common ones irritable bowel, autoimmune diseases can be activated from it, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, inability to lose weight, and then certainly infections can be a part of that. Who here has acid reflux, bloating, belching, or to that like? Any, who has stomach symptoms? If you don't want to raise your hand because you're embarrassed, I get it. But um, a lot of us have these ongoing problems that we need to address. Next slide. 
So the microbiome isn't just in your digestive tract, it's pretty much all over your body. So we focus on the digestive tract and how it impacts the rest of the body. But I thought this was a great slide to talk, to show that you know, the digestive tract starts in your mouth and goes all the way to the bottom. And there's different parts in between that we need to work with. So it's not just your stomach, but it starts on how you digest in your mouth and how your saliva is and how you um, absorb things that way as well. All right, next slide. Um, all right, so there's you know, good bacteria and then there's bad bacteria. Um, unfriendly bacteria, the two common ones are H. pylori and Shigella is another one. There's others. We can test for these through stool testing. Not that we do that on a regular basis, but if, if that's the case that we want to look at these, we can. Um, and it gives us an idea of which, which ones are, you know, the, the level of good ones and the level of bad ones and to what degree we might be able to treat that more specifically. Um, we don't, again, we don't always have to do it that way because we can pretty much manage uh, and help to rebound the gut um, in the other ways that we look at that. Um, so microbiome health, you can, it can change for a couple main reasons, in my opinion. If you don't have, if you weren't born naturally with natural birth or your mother didn't have healthy microbiome and you colonize as you go through the, uh, the vaginal tract, if you have C-sections, you're not exposed to the vaginal bacteria and the promoting that digestive system, as well as you can take too much antibiotics and kind of have that impact. Now, toxins and things like that, antibiotics, and then certainly our diet can has, has an impact on the, the level of health of the microbiome. So um, C-sections definitely are more problematic with the kids as they get bigger, as they get older. So that can kind of set them up, unfortunately, for um, more digestive tract issues as they get older. There's a, way, a couple ways that we can kind of approach that. Talk to us later, we can talk about that. Um, and this kind of shows the difference between the, uh, with birth and how these, the impact on um, the gut microbiome, uh, vaginal infections, um, sometimes tooth decay can have an impact on the, on the maternal factors on the baby. Antibiotics, breastfeeding, genetics sort of play a role, and then toxins in our environment um, has a bi plays a big, big role. I was just down in Charlotte I'm a member of the uh, Medical Academy of Pediatric Special Needs, which is the biggest autism uh, medical provider group in the country. And you know, they talk a, we talked a lot about the nonverbal, non-speaking children this time, which was amazing. Um, but nonetheless, they, the biggest trigger, or I shouldn't say that, one of the biggest triggers of autism is the environment. The genes of, of individual kids, the genes load the gun, the environment shoots the gun. So, if there's a genetic predisposition, we have to worry about environmental factors, gut health, uh, toxic status, detoxification ability, and that can have an impact on all of that. But with kids, if they ha don't have an unhealthy microbiome, they're way more apt to have symptoms and problems. Um, you know, autism spectrum disorders would be definitely increased, potentially focus, concentration, memory and recall, as well as coordinations and balance and things like that can have an impact. Um, let alone irritable bowel and colic and all those things. So, next slide. So, I hope you can see this. If you can, I'll try and explain it. The left side, uh, this, this talks about how it can have an impact on your health and on an um, ability to lose weight or not status. On the left side, um, good bacteria. There's a group of bacteria. They're called bacterioides. They're supposed to be a little higher. There's a, their, their antagonist is called Firmicutes. They're supposed to be more balanced. People that are overweight, Firmicutes, gram-negative, they have leaky gut, they have what's called LPS inflammatory status um, from their gut, which we, I'll show you a test um, for one of my patients I put up here that shows you how we can test for that. Um, they, they have a higher risk or have more pro, um, predominantly have insulin resistance and prediabetes. Um, they have, obviously have a difficulty losing weight. The triglycerides in their LDLs are typically out of whack, and then they get a thing called insulin resistance, which are all leading towards diabetes and inability to lose weight. So patients that we see that are having a hard time losing weight, we look at their gut very, very quickly to help put them on the right health path. All right? Too fast, or are we good so far? I think I'm going a little fast. I get excited when I talk, sorry. <clears throat> all right, so going back to the gluten conversation. You can be gluten sensitive, but you don't have to be celiac disease or have celiac disease, sorry. Okay, so there's, there's a difference. Genetically, some people are prone to gluten than others. We can run a test for that. However, when you get checked for celiac disease, let's say by your provider and it's negative, could you still react to gluten? And the answer is emphatically yes. So the symptoms of gluten sensitivity almost mirror celiac disease, but 
you'll, we have patients that come in a lot that their doctors have tested them for that and said, well, you can just go on gluten because you don't have a celiac positive. And a lot of those patients have a gluten problem when they come see us, we confirm that and we put them on the right path. But you can definitely have a gluten problem from a non-celiac standpoint. Anybody been checked for celiac and they were negative? No, but a couple people. All right, next slide. And symptoms are just your stomach doesn't work right. All the, all, the, all the symptoms of a digestive tract that's not working right, I'm not going to go through all of them. All right, so I like this chart. This is a chart that graphs the, the, um, the year and then uh, the amount of Roundup or glyphosate and how it potentially links to celiac incidences in the country. So it's a direct, almost a direct one-to-one -one correlation for the use of Roundup and how uh, celiac disease has been diagnosed. Anybody ever seen something like this or heard that Roundup can be a problem for you or glyphosate, right? So Roundup is extremely problematic as a, as a food additive that they put in it. They've approved Roundup. If you see the second part, Monsanto, um, I don't know if they did it or the government allowed it to be, but it's been used now to dry down the wheat prior to harvest. And I think that was done in the late 80s. So it's not just you know, killing the bugs and preparing the soil or trying to prepare the soil, whatever. Um, but it, they do that to the actual wheat itself. And before grinding and milling the wheat, Roundup is added to it to make sure it's not wet so it prevents mold. And then they grind it up and we still get exposed to that. There's a contingent of healthcare providers that are in our space that feel that it's this component is why people are reacting to the gluten that's causing gut permeability. And then there's another contingent of us that say it's probably from being over hybridized and changed in its DNA and genetics. We say it's probably both because you can't get away from one and not the other. But the symptoms that are related, potential, that have been proven to be related um, and linked to Monsanto's Roundup, ADHD, Alzheimer's, birth defects, autism, brain cancer, breast cancer, cancer in general, celiac and gluten intolerance, chronic kidney disease, colitis, depression, diabetes, heart disease, hypothyroid, leaky gut, liver disease, Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS, MS, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, Parkinson's, pregnancy problems, infertility, miscarriages, stillbirths, obesity, reproductive problems, and respiratory illnesses. I think you all should consider maybe not eating Roundup. <laughs> so it's been proven that this is a huge component to why we have leaky guts. And then the manifestations thereof can be potentially, you know, damaging and dangerous. All right. So, gee, what can I eat if I can't eat gluten? Well, other foods are exposed to Roundup too. So there's, every year they populate this list. It's called the Clean 15 or the dirty dozen. And those are foods that you should probably eat organic and then the ones you can be okay to not eat organic. Um, the, I think strawberries were just added this year to the dirty dozen. But nonetheless, <laughs> strawberries, spinach, these are the ones you should consider doing organic if you haven't seen this list. We can keep it up here. You can take a picture of it later. You can write it down. Um, kale, peaches, pears, nectarines, apples, grapes, bell peppers, and hot peppers, cherries, blueberries, and green beans. All great for you. God made them for us, and they're delicious, but unfortunately, um, the Roundup and the other toxins and pesticides kind of leach through the skin, and we kind of get a toxic load when we eat those. Our, our world and our environment isn't getting more, or isn't getting less toxic, it's getting more toxic. Our bodies are having to deal with more and more toxins, and our genes load the gun and the environment shoots it. So people that are having more and more health problems, could this be a component? Absolutely. Is it? We don't know. We'd have to test for you. We can definitely test for heavy metals and toxins through uh, some testing that we do. <clears throat> the evolution of wheat, I put this in here to show you that it's not just a Roundup problem that's causing a gluten problem or a wheat problem, but it's a hybridization. So they've modified the, the grains. It's not God's grain anymore, we call it, that it's been over hybridized to become more profitable, grows in, on the side of cliffs and rocks and different temperatures, and we still get the, uh, the yield. Now, they, I was told they did it for um, health, or uh, excuse me, for reasons that I think are really noble to try to you know, help cure world hunger and get more yield and all that. The challenge is, is it's not God's grain anymore, so when our body looks at gluten in this way, it looks at it as though it's not a, a dog with four legs, it's a dog with 18 legs, six heads, and four tails. And so, 
the, it's not, an, it, and it's been classified as not a, um, a grain anymore. It's been classified as a new food group. So our body's immune systems are looking at this and not knowing what to do with it, so it turns on the immune system. 85% of your digestive tract um, is initiated, or it, of, when you have a digestive issue, 85% of your immune system is initiated in your digestive tract. So gluten can cause a whole bunch of different problems. We talked a little bit about how Roundup did that, but gluten itself, whenever your body's reacting to it, between migraines, uh, autism, lupus, arthritis, uh, alopecia, epilepsy, um, there's a whole bunch of conditions that can be related to gluten specifically, as opposed to just a stomach problem. Dairy, this kind of came with that with the same slide. So dairy can kind of be a problem too. Um, in certain situations, it's a big problem, but it can be uh, triggering with type 2 diabetes. Autism kids can have a problem. Epithelial, celiac disease can, be over, it can overreact to that. Crohn's disease, MS, lupus. Um, we don't Ten, we don't always tell our patients that they have to live a life of just minimalistic eating, except for gluten, at least in my world. And I think Dr. Turnpaws, Dr. Browse, and Dr. Dave's world, in our, our world, gluten is really, really problematic. Um, I'll steal another quote from Dr. Turnpaw. If gluten is really, really evil, how much evil do you want to have in your heart? So I do believe that, that it's definitely a problem. It's a huge cancer risk. I don't think any of you should be eating it not just because you do or don't have a gluten or celiac problem, but because Roundup is a problem and you're eating it, okay? Who here knew that they were actually eating Roundup when you ate gluten? Oh gosh, you're all knowledgeable. I don't even have to tell you this stuff. All right, so we get patients to come in. There's no evidence of this. There's no evidence that gluten is an issue. There's no evidence that it causes any problems. So I put through, I put a bunch of slides in here that are um, just, you know, probably old uh, PubMed research articles. Well, this one was from 2024, just in January, how Roundup or glyphosate impacts the microbiome, the gut-brain axis, the immune nervous system, and clinical cases of multi-organ toxicity. Next slide. Uh, gastrointestinal involvement in autism spectrum disorders, a focus on the gut, uh, the role of gluten in gastrointestinal disorders, 2023, gut, uh, gut permeability and osteoarthritis towards mechanistic review or understanding of the pathogenesis of systemic review, that was in 21. Interact with brain through chronic inflammation, implications for neuroinflammatory diseases and neurodegeneration and aging, 2022. So there's a lot that's really coming out more and more, but it's been in the literature for a long time. Just because we stick our head in the sand doesn't necessarily mean that it's, the problem's gonna go away, but just because you also don't look at the literature and research, it doesn't mean it's not a problem either, okay? Uh, migraines, you can keep going. I'll go slower then. <laughs> All right, so this one, um, I think this is the last like, research slide I put in there. This one is really kind of powerful. This one really goes through the extra intestinal manifestations of non-celiac gluten sensitivity and expanding the paradigm. Now this was done in 2018 by the World Gastroenterology Journal. And it talks about how the sensitivity from gluten standpoint is, is triggering Hashimoto's, which is a uh, hypothyroid condition, psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, balance and coordination, brain fog, depression, anxiety, irritable bowel, and fibromyalgia. It's kind of our talk today, right? So <clears throat> when Janet asked me, well, what do you want to talk about? I said, well, I don't know. What do you think I should talk about? And I said, well, what about this gluten thing or the, the irritable bowel thing or the gut permeability? We kind of all know about it, but didn't know if the community knew about it. And I said, well, I have this article, I'll just kind of make the seminar. So I kind of made the seminar based upon that PubMed article, but it's, it's a bigger problem than I think all of us are uh, aware of, or all of you are aware of. All right, so what does it look like? What's what, is, what is a celiac, look? Uh, if we looked at underneath a microscope, what does celiac disease look like compared to gluten sensitivity? I love this slide. So if you look here, you can see cell, 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 cell. When I talked about the tight junctions, these are the, the junctions that look, that are normal right here. And they're supposed to just be really super small, but have enough space to allow nutrients and minerals and amino acids and things like that to pass through, vitamins. But as it breaks down, then big things can come through, or bigger things like viruses and bacteria. When it breaks through the middle of the cell, we tend to think that that, or not so, the, in between the cell, we tend to think that that's more of gluten sensitivity. When it destroys the cell and goes right through the middle of it and through the nucleus, that's breakdown of the tissue. That's more of an autoimmune aspect. That's more what celiac disease looks like. 
So gluten sensitivity is still just as destructive as celiac disease, but obviously it's different. Either way, you're going to get open, like an open junction, an open pathway for bacteria, viruses, and things to get through the system where the immune system gets upset. Okay? If you have questions, we'll talk about this in a minute. <clears throat> so we already know the foods that are commonly consumed contribute to systemic symptoms in the body. Roundup is in our gluten. Gluten becomes a problem. Um, sometimes, whatever we have, if we're having an allergy to certain foods, that can become part of the problem. How does this happen? Our immune system, would, when they, you have an allergy to a food, it recognizes the food as a problem and it starts to turn on that response. And when it turns on the response, then you, your body gets through systemic inflammation. It turns on a systemic allergy response and then that can drive in a long process to pain and inflammation no matter wherever in the body. So that, those research articles are showing you the different symptoms that can be part of that. Um, it's always on guard to protect us and even more active in the digestive system. 85% of our immune system is activated, or immune system activation is initiated in the digestive tract, and when activated can cause pain and inflammation throughout the body. <clears throat> Many people with arthritis, whether from overuse, if you just worked hard arthritis, compared to rheumatoid or autoimmune arthritis, the arthritis, the itis part is inflammation. Arth means joint, so you have joint inflammation, but the inflammation part can be upregulated when you have foods or a gut that's telling your body to upregulate the inflammation. Follow? So, love her. So, um, when you have arthritis, oh, I, you know, it's just because I worked hard, or my back just because I worked hard, or I lifted, or I have a disc issue, you can amplify the inflammation because of your diet. So, you can have over amplification of an inflammatory response due to what you eat or how your body reacts to what you eat. It doesn't just have to be gluten. So we test patients for food allergies. Why? Because that ongoing inflammatory trigger that what you eat, so let's say it's blueberries, will drive this response and people never resolve. So in Allie's case, she didn't have a copper toxicity problem. She had an immune dysregulation problem. And when you know your body is overloaded over all, all the time with these different, um, immune reactions, whether it's blueberries or Lyme disease or copper, at some point we all have a tipping point and we reach, our, we reach the edge and we, and we go over the edge. And when you go over the edge, you drive what we call cell danger signaling, inflammation, and your body just drives pain, 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 and inflammation. We need to reset that. So we have to change people's diets temporarily, sometimes permanently, to kind of deal with that. This slide is our life on a piece of paper every day, every patient, every minute of every day. Dr. Turnpaw came up with this slide years ago. Keeping it simple, here's your gut, here's the permeability, perfect artwork, and then immune system, so that the TH1, that level, picture that being a seesaw. That's your immune system, okay? On top of it, where it says antigen presenting cell, naive T cell, picture a bucket or a stress bucket. The next slide, I think I have up there. There we go. <clears throat> so I always say, God gives you one size stress bucket, I can't give you a bigger one. All stressors have to stay in there without overload, okay? What is a stressor? We call them antigens. What is that? It's emotional, it's physical, it's pain, it's gluten, it's blueberries, it's whatever it is that your body's reacting to at some point, your body will overload because it only has a certain capacity. When people do this on a regular basis for a long period of time, for five years, right, Al? So when you do this, I'm gonna keep you, I'm gonna keep coming back to you. When you do it for five years, your brain gets good at doing things, either good or bad, unfortunately. So the signals in the brain keep saying pain, 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 pain. So to unwind that, we can't allow anything to overload to keep that signal up. So with our patients, we look extensively on what you eat, how you eat, how you digest, what, how you work out in the beginning so that you gain tolerance and you can, your immune system then recovers and you can kind of move forward and then you can go walk around parks and things with your kids and have fun. Underneath the bucket is a seesaw, that's your immune system. So when your body is reacting to something you're eating, so let's say you ate gluten and you have these huge swings of, uh, of immune inflammatory response, what's your stress capacity when it's, your bucket's sitting on its side? So your body isn't, you know, I have a pristine diet. I don't eat anything different. I don't eat sugar. I don't eat gluten, but I feel horrible. Well, maybe it's immune dysregulation, we call that. 
So we, look at, we can look through all of these different concepts in our labs and our testing to say, here's what you are. You have this, 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 or none of this, and this, whatever rabbit hole we have to go down, okay? If it's the gut that's constantly permeated, even though you stopped eating gluten or you stopped eating dairy and you just never fixed your digestive tract, that in and of itself can drive all of this. So we need to fix that really, really quickly or early on. And we just have to protect you from allowing it to reactivate again. So when you eat Roundup and you go on, you know, don't eat and you have a certain level of toxicity, your bucket gets overloaded, it can reinitiate, unfortunately. Follow? Not too confusing, I hope. All right. <clears throat> when, it, when you drive this response, it, whether your seesaw stuck or your bucket's overloaded, it tells your brain to go into a fight response. So these, the, the stuff down here on the bottom, it drives pain, poor circulation, inflammation, and what Dr. Turnpaw graciously terms, I don't feel good-itis. So the symptoms aren't just you know, limited to any of those. It's any symptom that you present with. We look at patients in this way, but all of you that come in to see us, you're an immune patient, you're not a celiac patient. You're an immune patient, you're not a Lyme patient. You're an immune patient, you're not an irritable bowel patient or a leaky gut patient. If we look at you that way, it makes more sense to us because it's the immune system that's trying to protect you from the world that we live in and what you're putting into your stomach and how your gut's reacting. Next slide. Oh, uh, okay, perfect. So I put a case study in there just to show you kind of a, a quick look at how we test, or the one test that we look at this with. Um, this patient, 62 years old, came in with migraine, or excuse me, muscle tightness, migraines, irritable bowel, already knew that she had it, fibromyalgia, back pain, reflux, anxiety, and gastroparesis, okay? My goals are to try to get rid of the muscle inflammation, improve my digestive health, and be able to do normal things without having more inflamed muscles. In the late 70s, I was diagnosed with IBS, so 1970s. In the mid 80s, diagnosed with hypothyroid, eight, 90s, fibromyalgia and headaches, 20s. It kept get, things kept getting worse for this patient over time. And they kept just trying to treat the symptoms, treat the symptoms, and things just kept going on and on and on. So next slide. So this test, and she was never, never was told that she needed to have, or maybe have a food test or get off of gluten. So considering this is a, an irritable bowel, leaky gut, gluten conversation, that's probably what it is. So gluten triggered myofascial joint pain. She was eating her problem all these years. She was eating gluten and it was driving all of her symptoms. But if you look up, well, I know you can't see this, but the one part of this test that we run, it shows a celiac profile. She's negative for celiac disease and she had been tested for that for years. She was negative. However, her intestinal permeability scores are through the roof. And she's got a lot of gut problems that's been specific for that test. It's called an anti-zonulin test. And this is the only company that I know of that tests that. And we use it on a regular basis to look and see if there's a, to what degree of leaky gut, at least I do, to what degree of leaky gut there is. And she was showing some gut infections. And she was showing over here that she also was reacting to, when the, when the body breaks down wheat into glutens and gliadins, she was reacting to the other side. And they never test for the other side of that. Gliadin reactivity can be, you know, asthma, exercise-induced um, uh, anaphylaxis, or you have a hard time breathing when you exercise. Um, you can get vertigo and dizziness from gluten. And you can also get addicted to gluten like it's an opioid. So she was, ha go back. You're, being too, you're going too fast. <laughs> so she has this marker here called a prodynorphin test. This test is really inexpensive in my opinion, but it's very extensive and worth every penny because it shows that she's likely to have a major withdrawal when she goes off of gluten. And she did. But she's remarkably better already because we got her off of gluten. Is that her only problem? She's had 50 years of priming her brain to tell it that it was in pain and inflammation. So we have to pull the gas off the fire, but we still need to you know, paint the walls, put the carpeting back in, right? So we still need to fix what's going on with that situation, and it's going to take some time. But no, when nobody gets the gas off your fire to let you put the fire out, are you ever going to get to new furniture? Never. So I thought that this was a great representation for the talk tonight on what we can do. This test is readily available in our office, but not a lot of other offices run these kinds of tests. So we call these outside lab tests. Unfortunately, the insurance companies don't pay for these kinds of tests, but they're super valuable to figure out what we need to do for you. 
Does everybody get this test? No, not necessarily. But it's one of those ones that's kind of a game changer, at least in my book, to help really put you on the right path. OK? Uh, next slide. I only got two more, I think. So this, the, the, the test gives you some uh, definitions on what's uh, some of the terminology that's in there. This is the GLAD definition. I wanted to show you this because it says on here, if a person has elevated antibodies to gluteomorphin or proteinorphin, they can have severe neurochemical reactions to gluten, which is also called a withdrawal response. And they can have mood swings, depression, abnormal bowel activity when they try to go off of a gluten-free diet or go on a gluten-free diet. And um, this patient was in bed for three days, going through withdrawal, sweating like it was like an opioid which is scary, but it's not dangerous. She's, she's gotten over it. She's done remarkably well. But she can never eat gluten again because it would initiate. Not everybody has this type of a problem with it, but this test gives us a good idea on what to, how to tell you what to expect when we go off of gluten. And then it talks about intestinal permeability. Um, zonulin acts as a gatekeeper between the cells of the intestinal lining, which is the bond that's between the cells. Um, symptoms, what was I wanted to show you on this one? Uh, decreased barrier function, it's a, it's a, gut, it's a strong gut-brain connection. So people can have migraines, it can turn on joint pain, myofascial pain syndromes from the gut itself. So could you have a hidden digestive problem that you might not necessarily have symptoms for that's causing backaches, headaches, migraines, hormonal issues? Absolutely. And I hope I made my case. All right, I, think, I don't think there's any more slides. Oh, I did put this in here. All right, so Janet told me, she's like, well, when, when you summarize it, you should at least give them something that they can take home and do on their own, because not all of you I know are going to come see us, which I hope you all do. Um, stop eating gluten for a couple weeks. If you don't have a prodynorphin reflex and have a withdrawal, you might see some huge changes just by going off of gluten. The bigger problem with that is when you go off of gluten, you might not see any change, but you might still need to be off of it. So if you go off of gluten, you don't see any different. Oh, I tried to go off of gluten, it didn't work. Well. Did you, per, did you have gut permeability? Did you have gut infection? So it's not just go off of gluten and I'm fine, okay? Or it didn't work. So, but it could make a big difference. If you see symptom change, then that could clue you in that you might need to do a little bit more. If you eat more clean fruits and vegetables and clean proteins and reduce your sugars in processed foods would be a huge first step. Dr. Turnpaw talks about the hand of health. And one of the hands of health, one of the fingers is eat right and move right and sleep right. But if you eat better and you're not driving inflammation, Ali had talked about that she had to go off of sugar and can't eat a lot of sugar. Sugar drives inflammation. If you've got pain and inflammation, why are you making more pain and inflammation? So when you go on a low sugar diet, a gluten-free diet or a low carb diet, eat fruits, vegetables, proteins, gluten-free, it can really set the stage just to help your body unwind its inflammatory process. Add in probiotics. Uh, hopefully, you know, anybody's or everybody's tried probiotics every once in a while. Probiotics can really make a big difference. Digestive enzymes, as we age, our ability to make hydrochloric acid goes down a little bit. So as we get older, sometimes we just need a little extra support. You can actually do fermented foods as part of that. Um, kombucha, things of that nature. Um, and you can just take some herbal bitters. They actually work really well to help digestion. Uh, you can try to add an aloe vera or L-glutamine. So there's, as the junctions get opened, we want to heal that. So there's certain natural things. Aloe vera liquid is actually pretty good for that. We have some uh, supplements and powders that would help that. It's called L-glutamine and then DGL licorice, which helps to heal that. But on your own, you can do some aloe vera liquid. That would help, potentially. I'm not trying to treat you guys, but you never know. Uh, liver detoxification, milk thistle, dandelion root, herbal bitters, and then drink more water. It's amazing how many patients come in that are dehydrated and they have zero idea they're dehydrated. Um, I battle with dehydration a lot and so I have to do a lot of electrolytes. Um, but just by drinking more water can make a huge difference. Half of your body weight in ounces per day is your target. Okay? I know it's a lot, right? And if, you, if you're not used to it, it's a lot. So your body will be like, oh, I'm drowning if you're drinking a lot like that. But you will get used to it over time if you keep trying to push it a little bit. Um, you do need to, a lot of people do need to add in some electrolytes if you sweat a lot, if you're working out in the sun. But healthy electrolytes, not the ones that have a lot of sugar. Uh, antimicrobial support, coconut oil is a really good way to help with uh, some of that. Um, just taking a scoop of coconut oil every day, put it in your coffee, bullet coffees if you've ever done those. 
oil of oregano capsules, and then some antiparasitics. We love uh, an herbal tincture called cryptolepis. Um, but just simple things that are antimicrobial can make a difference. And then be, move more and be active. Um, you know, eat well, sleep well, move well. The more that we move, the more that we generate energy for our body is really, really helpful. And uh, sleep better. Be conscious of the amount of sleep you're getting or not. Don't, be, don't make yourself feel guilty if you sleep more on a Saturday morning or a Sunday or take a nap in the afternoon if your body's calling for it. Don't beat yourself up. You're not lazy. Your body's actually asking for it. So try to sleep a little bit better. And so I think that those are, I think with this, well, the talk in mind is a great kind of a summary to just do things that you can do uh, at home and uh, hopefully help you on your, on your way to health. But um, I hope you learned something tonight. Um, I hope I didn't talk too fast. And um, all of us will be up here for some question and answer. I'll hang out a little bit. If there's any questions, fire away. Thank you. Just for the sake of the fact that we are recording tonight and it is going to be available to um, people through the Turnpaw um, site, we want to make sure that if someone does ask a question, I know you're probably not going to want to use a microphone, um, but we are going to bring a microphone around to you. So if you do have a question that you'd like to ask, we just ask that you would just use the microphone just so it can be recorded so people can hear not only the answer, but actually the question as well. So we did a recording before and we only got the answers, but not the questions. Questions. So if anyone has a question, I'd be happy to bring the microphone to you. And you can ask it of anyone. <laughs> They're so excited. <laughs> Hi, thank Hi. you so much for your, um, for your talk there. Come. You mentioned about um, if this aim fifty years of telling her brain that she's in pain, something like that. Hmm. I thought maybe right up my, here. I'll, I'll move back. Okay. Yeah, that's probably what it was. Yeah, something about fifty years. Um, her body telling her brain that she's in pain or something like that. Could you? Yeah. So one of the one? so when you look at the ongoing chronicity of someone's health, when you get your brain to have a constant signal of inflammation, I see in a lot of my patients that the body gets kind of good at doing that. So sometimes those patients aren't as easy to say, go off of gluten. Let me put you on a probiotic and you're gonna feel great. Um, oftentimes that works great, that's wonderful. But when people have ongoing health problems, I don't feel that you can go from fight and flight to rest and repair and you're repaired. It takes time to repair, but you have to stay in rest and repair. So when there's a 50 year problem, I can't certainly sit there and tell that patient, you're gonna, be, you're gonna do great in a year, three months, two weeks. I have no idea. But what I do know is those patients that have had a long-standing health problem like that, the signals of inflammation and what we call cytokine activation that tell the brain that there's a problem, there's a problem, there's a problem, there's a problem. At some point, your brain's just going to be like, okay, there's going to be a problem today, right? And even when you remove gluten, is the brain going to just turn that off to not tell the immune system to protect us? And I, a lot of people know. It's, so part of the reason that people go seek other providers and try to do healthcare and recovery and it doesn't, isn't successful is that nobody explains that the brain is really kind of in the background or the immune system really in the background that's stuck in protect mode. So I always, my weird brain, I always say, if you were a caveman, you had to go out for dinner for everybody. And you didn't know if you were gonna die and get eaten by a dinosaur, the stress of leaving the house and almost dying and then coming back saying, yeah, I had a good day, no big deal. Well, that's a lot bigger of a stress than just coming back home and say, oh, here's some meat. I got you some, you know, I got dinner. So, you know, not that we're all cave people, but there's a level of stress that we're all under and we can't sit, we can't really say that that's not affecting us. And so unwinding that is a big part of our focus. We have, Dr. Panettone is in our Mechanicsburg office and she does uh, clinical psychology. So when, you know, we get a lot of success with patients, but there's still limitations in their recovery, oftentimes we'll refer to her to help unwind that. That makes sense. I hope. Yep. Come on, there's got to be another question. Yeah. I thank you for that good information to share. Um, got a question. In your opinion, when you talk about gut permeability, how does it affect, like, as far as taking like vitamins and minerals 
if you're not maybe digesting your food properly right now, how do you, will the supplements be effective or how does that work? And they, there's a little bit of a deficiency sometimes in the over-the-counter supplements. They're not made as high quality and as high absorptive as they could be. So um, when we have our supplements in our all of our offices, we kind of pick and choose the ones that we know are going to be really absorptive and really um, um, give people the biggest um, um, result from taking the supplements. So not that we say we mandate that you buy our supplements, but we know they're going to work in the presence of a leaky gut, of an imbalanced microbiome, of an inflammatory state. They're still going to get into the system enough to help make a change. Um, not all supplements are made that way specifically. But, you know, over time, you know, you got to start somewhere. If you're not digesting and breaking down your food efficiently, but yet you need all those nutrients to resolve it, at some point we have to have a give and take. We have to figure out how to feed the body and, you know, move forward without, and before we can actually physically heal the gut. So luckily we've figured that out. Actually, Dr. Trumpas figured that out years ago and taught all of us that. So, um, but it, w there's definitely ways we can do that. And that's a lot of times why if you're taking supplements on your own, maybe you're not feeling difference. Maybe you're taking vitamin D and it's not going up in your blood chem. There's a reason for that. And sometimes it's the, the supplement you're buying and it's just not absorbing. There's a genetic snip that can kind of cause low vitamin D absorption. And so you just have to take more. And then if your gut's not breaking down the fat, we can help all those things. That's a great question. Hope I answered it right. Oh, Dr. T. <laughs> Thanks. He, um, what are your thoughts on organic grains or organic bread? Oh, oh, grains or breads. It's, it's still a potential problem when you look at the, um, the over-hybridization. Um, there are patients that go to Italy and eat those grains and say they don't react as much, but it's still gluten. So if you had a celiac problem, it's probably not a great idea to initiate that too quickly until you unwind the system, downregulate the inflammation, and heal the, heal the, uh, the immune system in the gut. Um, but there are patients, as they gain tolerance, that they could potentially add that in but it's risky because it's still gluten. Do you have a, you have a little bit of answer for that one too? <laughs> you have to say something. Something. I'm right behind you, so I feel like I'm yelling at you. So. Hi, I'm on a microphone. Um, when your body gets a taste, when your immune system gets a memory to a, a something, any bug, it develops memory B cells. It actually remembers it. So the best, the next time you see it, you're more efficient at fighting it. So if you developed at any point in your life a sensitivity to gluten, whether it was glyphosate, you know, hybridized or native from Jerusalem, uh, once you develop that sensitivity, then any species that looks like it, you're going to have a memory to. So if you never saw it before and you only ate native, it's a better argument. Once you've developed the sensitivity to it, these are my antibodies, they remember what they saw, and it says, well, you look enough like somebody else I didn't like, I'm going to attack you too. So now you can't even handle the native unhybridized. And it's a tolerance, like his stress bucket, brilliant picture, it's a tolerance level. So some people can tolerate it. My son went to France, and he tried the native wheat. He has the reaction of narcolepsy when he eats wheat. In the middle of dinner, he fell on his plate eating native wheat because he was told by somebody very famous that you're fine to eat it there. And when he woke up, he goes, that guy doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> All right, anybody else? Come on, one more question at least. Nope. There were some hands that went up over here. Um, oh, 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 vitamin D3 and K in regards to the supplementation. Okay. Um, we always have, in our office, we have vitamin D3. That was a good question. What was the question? Joel, are we still on? All right, the question was, what type of vitamin D is best to take? Um, we all only advise vitamin D3, with, and then adding vitamin K with it will help protect from increasing D and potentially grabbing calcium from your bones. 
So vitamin D centralizes, uh, centralizes calcium, but it's really needed for immune recovery. So that centralization of calcium, vitamin D will bring calcium from the digestive tract and absorb it in, which is great. We don't want it to come from the bone. So vitamin K protects and keeps it at the bone and allows your body to have um, a normal calcium level and doesn't change the calcium level, but we can get the immune boost from it. That makes sense, is that what you were asking? Okay. Anna. I just uh, wondered what your take on is like gluten-free grains as far as like the Bob's Red Mill one-to-one, -one, is that safe? And then another question is, um, I've been reading a book called No Grain, No Pain. It talks about uh, corn and rice also having gluten in it, and I didn't know what you felt about that. Hey, um. Well, I didn't realize corn and rice having gluten. Oh, because it's mill it's milled on the same mill. Okay. Yeah. What he said. No, I'm kidding. Um, gluten free products tend to be okay for people unless you're talking about diabetes, because they're massively high in sugar. They're not really health conscious. If you look at the ingredients in them. In order for them to be tasting other taste like other than cardboard, they put a lot of sugar in them. So um, with that in mind, you really have to be careful with eating too much of gluten-free. Um, some patients that have a gluten problem do react to the gluten-free products. We call that polyreactivity. So not everybody. In our patient population, when you come in, we encourage you not to eat gluten-free products for about four to six weeks in the initial phase to put the fire, put the gas, or take the gas off the fire, put the fire out, and start the, the healing and the recovery. Longer term patients usually can eat some gluten-free products and not have a problem, but some people do react to them. Bob's Red Mill, I mean, my wife buys all their flowers and bakes at home and does all that stuff, and they taste pretty good, but they're still carbs and it's still sugar, so we try to limit it. I'm just wondering about dosage for vitamin D3 and the vitamin K. Like, how, how much should you take? Um, that's probably part of Tammy's question that I didn't answer. Uh, it depends upon the individual. You should get tested. And if you see, so today I had a patient came in, their vitamin D was uh, 12. We never want to see it, our world, we never want to see it less than 80. 55 to 80 is ideal. So that person, um, I encourage them to take a lot because they were having some health problems. Um, a lot of health problems. So, you know, for them, they're going to take 10,000 a day to start. The medical dose to increase vitamin D that they, te they tend to give people on a prescription is 50,000 I use per week. So right around there is safe in that world. But you still should test because you can become toxic with vitamin D because of the calcium levels can get up really high. So you can't just take that indefinitely without getting your blood chemistry tested. So... You know, everybody's different. I have one patient that takes 1,000 IUs per week, and that's enough for her. She's about 74, and it keeps her level of vitamin D right around 70. And then I have other patients that take 20,000 a day, and it keeps their levels right around there. So, and then I'm sure Dr. Trumpaugh and the other docs have more, but it's individualized. And you can't just say, oh, I'm going to take 5,000 a day, and I'll be fine, because that's what everybody's doing. You still should test. You should still test. For vitamin K um, through the labs, um, we don't. I don't ever do that. Do you guys ever run vitamin K? Yeah, that's right. It's it's K1, not K2. MK7, vitamin K2, MK7 is the best form of vitamin K. So if you're buying a vitamin D product, just look on the back and see what kind of vitamin K. Normally, that's what's in it. If you buy it from us, we have a product called Defend that has vitamins A, D, E, and K. The vitamin A and the E, or we we feel they're way way better, not only to help the D absorption. But there's a massive cardiovascular support that goes along with the A and the E. Um, you know, so we were pretty much ahead of the game. We changed all of our vitamin D to that about five years ago when the literature came out on that. So there's a strong component of taking all the fat-soluble vitamins together. It work, kind of works better. At least that's what we think. So we have a 5,000 and a 10,000, um, two different products. Store in the Richfield office. All, this, all of the offices have a supplement store, but 
Um, uh, ours has grown tremendously over the last couple months specifically. So we carry a large um, uh, amount of supplements in our s supplement store that are available to the public. So you are able to come in. Um, we can set up a portal for you to purchase supplements. Um, but again, it is recommended to get those blood tests done so you aren't doing a supplement overload. And so yeah. you're making sure that you get the correct supplements, um, but they are available in Richfield office. Thank you very much for your talk. It was very interesting. Um, I don't know if this is actually on topic, but I've been hearing and reading a lot people um, starting to drink a lot of raw milk and saying that a lot of wonderful things are happening with raw milk. And also, do you have any kind of opinion on any of the uh, vitamin, uh, the fruits and vegetables supplements that you can buy in pill form, you know, that uh, a lot of people are saying, you know, you can't have, you know, six servings of fruits and vegetables every day, but if you take these pills, they're all organic. Do, any, any comment on that? We have powders that we can, we can mix with water. A lot of the kids that don't love vegetables, we can at least give them that and they can have a really good amount of phytonutrients by doing it that way. Raw milk, I'm glad Dr. Turnpaw's here. He'd probably have a better conversation with that. Um, I grew up on drinking raw milk, but it's not nece it wasn't necessarily a, um, a, a common thing back then, but I'm glad you're here to answer that question. We, we actually published a paper on this to show the health effects of <clears throat> raw. Raw milk depends what, still depends what the animal ate. So if it's the animal, it, it could be raw and organic, but it's from corn, it's still inflammatory. So raw organic grass-fed A2, it also depends on the breed of the cow. If it's A2, A2, instead of, which is like your Jersey and Guernseys and some of your Holsteins, but your Holsteins are mostly A1. They're the only mammal that's A1. All other mammals are A2. So if we're designed and created to drink breast milk, which is A2, then we should probably be drinking A2 milk, but we're also not calves, so we shouldn't drink a lot of milk anyway. So I never saw another species wean on another animal. So <clears throat> so raw milk what rum, actually, there was a study out of Harvard in 2012 that said nobody should drink any milk other than raw milk. Of course, it got buried. The raw milk keeps all of the probiotics in the milk, you know, all the stuff that's naturally there that's supposed to inoculate the baby animal, or in this case, us. Um, so the raw milk keeps it there. Raw milk comes at a risk because the reason that it's pasteurized is because it kills off any bacteria. So it's hard to do factory farmed raw milk easy to do family farmed raw milk and you want to make sure that the animal ate healthy because everything gets condensed 11 times greater in the fat of the milk so if they have toxins they're condensing it 11 times in the fat of the of the animal so is it organic is it grass-fed grass finished is it um a2 a2 and then it's safer and then you have to say you're feeding it to your cat or the FDA is going to come and tell you you can't buy it. So, like, it's for animals only or you have to, you have to join a co-op because you're not really – There's it's hard to just go to the grocery store and buy raw milk. But, you know, the days of the of days of old, you just went in your backyard and you got raw milk and it was an A2 and you didn't have to worry about it because it came right into the bucket and you scooped the cream off the top and you're good to go. So it, it's just historical. The way it was, the animal ate grass – it wasn't genetically hybridized to be A1, and there was no pesticides because they weren't invented yet. So if you go back in time, that's just what we did. Oh, that's a great answer. I don't know if I could do that. I would, no way could I do that. He's so good. Every time I hear that question, I'm like, oh, Chris, if Chris was here. <laughs> okay, a question for you or I'd love, and or Dr. Turbo. Uh-oh. Um, Switch roles, get up here. <laughs> So Last you time you got up here, we opened up an office. I don't know. We're not going to do that again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Last time. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, he's like, oh, I'll come support you. I'm like, okay, fine. So we came up here. We spoke for like till 1030 at night. And he's like, yeah, we're opening up an office. It's like, what? And we did. So I told Heather we're not opening an office. So I, another one. Anywhere else you'd want to pick. We're not doing that again never right now. Right now. Never. Sorry. So. The question was, you said most everybody in here has leaky gut, which I wouldn't disagree with, but is there more than just um, like the round Degrees of leaky gut. Okay. Well, degrees, but so 
we probably weren't born that way. So whatever the years causes that. So we got like glyphosate, we got antibiotics. You could what be born. You could have been born that way. Oh, okay. I'll yeah. let you guys. Just so tell if me. if you know, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> um, if you if you I'll, he might he'll probably add to this because it's if you were weren't born if you were born with a C-section, then there's a likelihood that you're going to have an increased risk of leaky gut because you didn't get the microbiome from the mother. Now, if you had it, if you were, if your baby's born C-section, and then you transfer vaginal fluid into the baby's mouth, then there's then they'll culture, and that's the start of their microbiome. Um, in utero, toxins can start to cause leaky gut. Um, heavy metals and pesticides and exposures can start to initiate gut permeability. There's literature out there for the autism kids that that can definitely be potentiated. Um, so it's not always that you're born with a healthy digestive tract. What was the other part of your question? Toxins, heavy metals can all be part of that. Parasites, um, candida, candida, medications, antibiotics. Go ahead, Dr. T. He's lack of breastfeeding. Go ahead, Dr. T. You have to t there you go. Turn on the speaker. You're, uh, you are born with a leaky gut. That's God's creation because you're getting your immune system from mom and her immunoglobulins, those big immunoglobulins, if you don't have a leaky gut, they can't get in to give the, so you hear the baby gets your immune system. So everybody's born with a leaky gut by creation. You're supposed to have a leaky gut and then it's supposed to heal. And what prevents it from healing are the things he spoke of. But what also prevents it from healing is stress because stress is fight or flight, not feed and breed and rest and repair. So if your baby's colicky, doesn't sleep through the night, you yell at your baby, scream at your baby, don't shake your baby, you know, all those things matter and you ingrate. So if you're under stress, what causes leaky gut? Working hard. Instead of taking a nap, drinking a cup of coffee. You know, working hard, coming home, being stressed, fighting with your spouse. All those things can induce leaky gut. Now we repair quickly, but all of those things that are stressful, when you go through a stress response, the first thing that happens when you're under stress is you thin your mucosal lining, which is your defense mechanism in your gut, and then you develop leaky gut. So at this point, his stress bucket is a brilliant picture because anything that stresses you can promote a leaky gut. Anything that's not stressing you when you're in restaurant repair promotes repair of the leaky gut. But with birth, it's just, it's a point that I strive. You're born with a leaky gut because that's how you're supposed to be born because mom's breast milk has immunoglobulins in it. So if a baby's born and never gets breast milk, you're just passing all those toxins in the artificial milk into the baby without an immune system. So. Oh, yeah. That's why I invited him, so he could f fill in the gap. Kenny. <laughs> yes. I'd be miss if I didn't bring this up. And okay. I, I, it's a little bit of a loaded question. I know uh -oh. some of my own personal answer to it. But I, for the benefit of everyone, and I, I say this because I'm a patient. You guys have helped me a lot with <laughs> talking through this. But I wanted to ask your opinion on like the demineralization. Maybe this is a whole other topic of our potentially of our food sources right now that oh. we see in the U.S. and how that affects things like um my wife gets tired of me talking about it but i'm a firm believer in like magnesium and what we yeah and how that plays a role in a lot of what we're talking about and yeah, there's definitely a, a, over time there's been definitely a, a less healthy soil less healthy ability to grow uh healthy nutrient-packed um vegetables and fruits um i don't remember where the study was that i, I saw that they they did they went around to different cities detroit la whatever and they tested the tomatoes. They, just grabbed them, they grabbed them from just grocery stores, and they tested the tomatoes and the cucumbers or whatever. And it was amazing to me on the difference in the available amounts of vitamin E or selenium or vitamin A or whatever in the products that you would just assume were very nutrient-packed. And, um, you know, so it's, there's a definite deficiency not only in our soils, but in different pockets of the country there's different deficiencies, as well as magnesium is really deficient in our soil. Um, everybody should really take a magnesium supplement let alone vitamin D and a multivitamin because people just aren't getting the nutrients that they think that they're getting from the foods that we're eating. And furthermore, the standard American diet is horrible. And the sad diet is simply sad because people are eating just carbs and junk and barely any vegetables because you're trying to, you know, the kids don't even eat a lot, like, like they'll eat a lot of vegetables. So, and the adults are the same way. So it's a very carbohydrate, sugar-based diet, which is very nutrient deficient and it depletes. So when you eat a ton of carbohydrates, you need a ton of B vitamins.
to help you process those to get rid so that because you're always you're also nutrient void so you need b vitamins to help process those foods in your gut so you're further deficient in b vitamins because of the diet that you eat and then b vitamins are very deficient under stress if you're on the birth control pill i mean so b vitamins alone are massively deficient i usually put everybody i have on on b vitamins because everybody's stressed but yes the soils are definitely deficient anybody want to add to that agree since they're here, I have, you know, have to include them. No kidding. Oh, it's the truth. I mean, it's, it's the, I know. <laughs> oh, boy. I want to. Yeah. I should have said, what did you tell them? And I'm like, I agree with you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, multivitamins. I mean, every, I can't remember what, it was a few years back that they basically said everybody should take a multi, a good one. And that absorbs and you know breaks down your gut and all that. So we, of course, Dr. Trumpa made one. He called it Multitasker. It's a great multivitamin. It really works well. It absorbs well. Not super high in any one thing, but it's a great multi. It's just general. We, I use that a lot for patients. So if you wanted to get a multi, it's called Multitasker. Come in and buy some. It's great. Any other questions? I mean, we could be here all night. No? Well, thank you for your time. Hopefully, we'll come back up. Um, Jan, are you taking, if you have any questions or maybe want to have another talk, give us some topics that you might want to hear a little bit more about, whether it's me or Dr. Brow or Dr. Turnpaw or Tammy can kind of come up and talk. I know she loves to talk as well. Dr. Dave, Jody. Uh, but nonetheless, if you can give us some ideas, that would be great. I think you're taking some of those. It's on that list. So, but thank you very much for your time. So thank you so much for coming this evening. Our providers are here and they would love to answer questions. Again, have a great evening. Thanks so much for coming. <laughs>